Friends, we are having technical difficulties today. So, if the audio is awful, I apologize. My partner is trying to pry the battery out of my mic as we speak. You get... Never mind, my partner has just informed me that he has successfully pried the battery out of my mic so I can buy new batteries and fix that. But for this and the coming videos, that's not an option because I'm filming them all right now. Thank you, Bear. Uh, okay, well, at least in the future, mic issues won't be an issue, but this light is being a real bitch and keeps turning off, so if I have to swear at it, I apologize, that seems to work. Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. Cliche, I know, but it's the first of June when I'm filming this. It's gonna be later in June when you're seeing this, but you know how it works. Anyways, it's June and let's talk about what I read in May. Oh my goodness. I actually read a lot in May. I did not expect to. I thought I was gonna read like five books all month and um, it was a lot more than that. So let's dive right in and get going so we can get through this and I can film the other three videos I'm gonna film after this. The first book I finished in May was True Gert by David Hunt. This is the second volume in his Unauthorized History of Australia, and it is a laugh out loud funny history of Australia. This volume covers, I think, sort of about 1800 to 1850s-ish? I don't know off the top of my head, but roughly that period. So it's not the initial colonization period, but the sort of decades after that. I thought it was hilarious. Like seriously, I was obnoxious to be in a room with while reading this because I kept just snorting and laughing. And then I would read parts out loud to Bear and he didn't find it as funny. We'll forgive him for that though. I thought it was hilarious. It is scathingly critical of both the early colonists and modern day Australia and the modern day Australian government. So if you appreciate some political commentary in your history, which I mean, I think only makes history better, but you do you. This one's one to check out. Also, if you love fantastic footnote use, this one again, Super funny, super hilarious, perfect use of footnotes. I will say that it's a little bit all over the place in terms of time and people. So if you know absolutely nothing about Australian history and want to have a really good understanding of like actual sequences of events and understanding who people were and stuff, and you only want to read one book, this one maybe isn't the best choice. But if you want to learn a lot while also being incredibly entertained, then you can't go wrong here. I then read Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. This is his newest novel about a man who wakes up with amnesia on a spaceship and has to figure out who he is, where he is, and why he's there. And I'm not going to say anything more because I have two vlogs already will be linked up here. Hopefully that's the right corner. I think it is. Probably most of you and also a lot of those of you who aren't watching this have already seen these videos because they are by far my most successful videos ever. So that was cool and very exciting and I've become very annoying and keep going, guess who has a video with 370 views? And then my partner goes, is it you? And I go, yes. But uh, yeah, those vlogs were I guess really good, so if you haven't seen them, check them out. But, oh my goodness, I am so all over the place, gonna try and keep on track. The third book I finished in May is another one that I've got a separate video about, and that is The ABC Murders by Agatha Christie. I will link my review up here. I read that for part of Hugo's of A Scientist's Reading World, Eight Perfect Murders in May project thing, and it was really fun, and like I said, and that's again, whole video, not gonna talk about it anymore here because we've got more books to get to. I then read Hotbox by Matt and Ted Lee. Matt and Ted are brothers who are also food writers who seem to work together, which is pretty cool, and they got interested in the world of catering, and they realized they knew very little about it, they'd read very little about it, they didn't really see anyone writing about catering, the way people write about restaurant kitchens. So they decided to get jobs with catering firms and actually work in the industry, not just like standing in a kitchen watching what's happening, but like actually working the line, working events, doing prep work for like four years in order to research and write this book. All of the chapters sort of present information about the catering industry, but using their experiences 
as a frame or as context. I think it could be best described with my favorite word, which is narrative nonfiction, or I guess that's technically two or three words, but you know what I mean. It was very fun, it was engaging, the writing was really what I was looking for in this type of book. There was some history, there was a fair bit of logistics, there was a ton of food, and it was everything I wanted it to be. I then decided to finally read Revolution Sunday by Wendy Guerra, which I have been wanting to read this book since I bought it last summer, and I guess May was the month for it. This is a novel about a Cuban poet who finds herself under suspicion from basically everybody after she travels from Cuba to Spain to promote a new poetry collection. From what I understand, it's semi-autobiographical, I think? From what I've seen in like a brief biography of the author, she did have similar experiences. She is a Cuban poet who's widely published in the Spanish-speaking world outside of Cuba, but not super known in Cuba. There's been various events in her life that sound like they're kind of not exactly what happens in this book, but similar experiences. Fittingly, since the author and the narrator are both poets, this was a super beautiful and poetic feeling novel. However, it's also the sort of writing that I find kind of intimidating. It felt very much like I really needed to be paying attention and that there was a lot that was going on in this and that I needed to pay attention and figure what was happening and like catch what was happening or catch what was being said and what was not being said. Not sure if I did a good job at that or not, but it was still an enjoyable read. I don't think any novel can portray exactly a universal picture of what it's like to live in a certain place and in a certain time. I do feel like this book gave me one perspective of what it might be like to live in modern Cuba. Again, not saying it's the only perspective or the right perspective, but it very much did feel like I feel the sense of place, and what's more than that, I feel how this person feels existing in this place and existing in this society. And I thought that was really fantastic. So while I didn't love this book and I don't think it's going to be a new favorite, it was a very, very interesting book to read. I'm going to absolutely butcher the pronunciation of this next title, and I would like to apologize to all of my Spanish teachers, and also especially to anyone who speaks Spanish and who is listening to this. I'm gonna do my best, but it's not going to be pretty, and I can know that for sure because I've already tried to say it like five times. The next book I read was American Brujeria, Modern Mexican-American Folk Magic by J. Allen Cross. This was actually an audiobook that I listened to, and it was also an ARC that I got from NetGalley. So thank you to NetGalley and the publishers Dreamscape Media for giving me access to this ARC. However, it's also already been released. It came out on May 1st, so if this sounds interesting to you, you can go pick it up now. This book is really hard for me to review, because this book wasn't for me. And that's not the book's fault. This book is doing what it set out to do. The fault lies entirely with me and my having requested it based on the cover and title alone without reading the description of what this book was about. I had assumed that this was going to be a theoretical slash academic look at modern Mexican-American folk magic, which sounded fascinating. However, it's really much more a user's guide or an introduction into how to practice modern Mexican-American folk magic. It was still really interesting and there was a lot of fascinating content in here, but this is written by and for someone who has a deep sense of belief both in religion and in folk magic. So as someone who is completely without faith, I couldn't get as invested in it. I did rate this book quite highly on Goodreads and the Storygraph, so if you saw my review there and are now confused, I rated this book based on what I think this book was setting out to do and how well it accomplished that. I don't usually mention star ratings in my reviews, but for context, I gave this four stars. For me, it was a two star read, but it's not the book's fault that this wasn't the book that I wanted to read, and especially where I think Cross is a debut author, and it's a small publisher, and I got an ARC. I didn't want to penalize anyone for the fact that I didn't do my research before requesting, so I gave it a four star, because I think that's what it would be if you read this book looking for what this book contains. It just wasn't for me. Okay, how many more times can I say that? Let's move on to the next book, which is Lords and Ladies by Terry Pratchett. This is yet another 
Oops, I took no notes, Terry Pratchett review. Basically, the weekend before the Do The Thing-a-thon, I needed something quick and fast and fun and light and enjoyable to read, so I picked up the next Terry Pratchett in publication order, because that's how I'm working through them right now, because I knew what I was getting into. This is the third proper witch's novel, and in this one, Magrat Garlic, the virgin of the coven, is getting married, and she's getting married to King Varence, the king of Lancre. And she's going to do this on Midsummer Night's Eve, or on Midsummer. I can't remember which it is exactly. Meanwhile, elves are trying to break through into the disc's reality, and Granny Weatherwax is feeling a bit old and not sure she's going to be able to protect her country from the elves. This was really enjoyable. I liked it a lot more than I remembered liking it last time I read it. I think I'm appreciating these books even more as I get older, but also it makes me want to do a bit of a deep dive into the type of elf, of elf lore that Pratchett was drawing on as inspiration from this, and then do a reread. Keep your eyes peeled in like maybe 2023 because I've got some thoughts. The next three books I'm going to mention I read for the Do the Thingathon, and I have a vlog of that entire readathon, which I will link up here if you want to hear some of my as I'm going thoughts. But the first of those that I finished was Beloved by Toni Morrison. This is an absolutely heartbreaking novel about a woman who has to sacrifice her baby daughter while escaping from slavery, and then the haunting of the family and the house by that daughter. As I've come to expect from Morrison, this was beautifully written. It was so punchy. Every single line, every single sentence, beautiful and made such an impact. I don't know what to say about this book. That's basically what I said in the vlog. That's what I'm gonna say here. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was beautiful and well written and I just don't know what to say about it. So I'm not gonna say anything else. I then read The Woman They Could Not Silence by Kate Moore. This is, yes, the same Kate Moore who wrote The Radium Girls. She has a new book coming out in June. I also had an arc of this one from NetGalley, so thanks again to NetGalley. And I should have noted the publishers for this, but I didn't, so thanks to whoever that was. This is a biography, I guess you could call it, of a woman who in the 1860s was imprisoned in an insane asylum by her husband, despite the fact that she was perfectly sane, because he was threatened by her intellect and her political ideologies. She started getting involved in the abolition movement and in the early women's rights movement, threatened by this, so he has her locked up for years. Instead of going insane from the torture of being confined in a sane asylum, as many women understandably did under these circumstances, Mrs. Packard uses this experience and just gets stronger and stronger and more and more keen to fight for others. I'm going to do a full review of this book because there's way too much to say in a wrap-up, which is already probably going to be too long, so keep your eyes peeled in June for a full review. But if you're wondering if you should pre-order this slash pick it up when it comes out, yes. Yes, you absolutely should. If you liked The Radium Girls, I think you'll like this as well. The final book I read for the Do the Thingathon was Grave Importance by Vivian Shaw. This is the third book in the Dr. Greta Helsing series, which follows Dr. Greta, who is a medical doctor to the undead in... Well, she's based in London, but in the second and third book she's in France. I remember loving the first book in this series. It's actually the last book that I read before I started my booktube channel. I hadn't realized that until I was going through some old stuff today for a completely unrelated reason and noticed that, so that's kind of funny, but I almost feel like I need to go back and reread that first book because I remember the first book being pretty great, and unfortunately like the second, the third just didn't live up. I honestly have so many thoughts about this book and I don't know how to spin them into anything coherent, so I'm going to focus on something that I did mention in my reading vlog, but I think it's the main problem I had with this book and with the series as a whole so far. I don't know if there's going to be more, I'm not totally sure about that, but this series doesn't feel like a trilogy, but the ending of this book is written as if it is a trilogy. So what do I mean by that? In the first book, I thought it was going to be a procedural style series where each story is going to be pretty self-contained, dealing with its own thing, its own mystery, its own case, whatever you want to call it, and in the next one we're looking at something new. And I was excited about that. That worked for me. The second book started to 
lay the beginnings of what seemed like a possible longer term story. But we didn't get into it that much. It wasn't that developed. It was more, here's the beginnings of something, like what I would expect in a first book if this was going to be a trilogy, but it wasn't developing it that much because it was just being introduced. And then the third book, all of a sudden we're in the big finale of it, and it felt like we skipped something. It really felt like we skipped at least one, if not multiple, books of development, both in terms of the overarching plot and in terms of some of the relationship stuff that's happening. It just really felt strange. This is pure speculation on my part, so I might be totally wrong, but I almost wonder if Shaw wasn't sure if she was going to get renewed for a fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever book, and decided to bring forward her overarching plot plans that were supposed to develop over maybe four or five books, and instead she squished them into two. I don't know. Maybe I'm just looking for justification. There was a lot of other minor elements that annoyed me about this book as well, but I don't want to rant for ages, and I... For all that I don't love these books, and for all that I don't think they fully work, I want to like them, so I don't want to harp on them too much. I think I look at them and I see, I'm seeing all the things you could be doing amazingly, just not quite pulling them off. So I don't know how to feel, but if Shaw does release a fourth book in this series, I will probably pick it up and read it, honestly, because there's a lot she's doing that I do like, and maybe it'll improve? I have hope. I want them to improve. I had time for a third audiobook at the end of May, and I decided to pick up The House in the Cerulean Sea by T.J. Klune. I really quite enjoyed this book. I got why everyone loved it. I had a whole positive review sketched up, and then yesterday I saw some stuff on Twitter that kind of made me put that to the side and need to focus on this instead. So, for those of you who aren't familiar, The House in the Cerulean the House in the Cerulean Sea is about an orphanage in a remote island where these very dangerous magical youth are being cared for, held, because they're deemed too dangerous to be around other magical youth or in society in general. For some reason in this world, it's never explained why, a lot of magical youth are orphans, there's a lot of prejudice against magical beings and magical people, and there's this government department that is in charge of caring for them, and they do, th they do this through these orphanages. Our protagonist in this book is Linus Baker, who is a caseworker for this department, whose job it is to go out and investigate the orphanages and make sure that they are being run safely and that the children are being cared for. Linus seems to actually really care about the well-being of the children he's looking in on, and it's very much implied that he's unique as a caseworker for this. It's a heartwarming story of a man who realizes he can have an impact on the world, and that things maybe aren't always as he see as they seem, and that different is special, and all of this sort of stuff. And then I read an interview in which T.J. Klune explains that he was inspired to write this book by the 60s Scoop. For those of you who are unaware, which fair, it's not something we're even taught that much in Canadian history, was a government policy in I think the 1950s and 1960s where Indigenous children were removed from their families and placed in either foster care or adoption with white families. This was done for the same reason that Indigenous youth were removed from their families and put into residential schools. It was to assimilate them and to basically make them no longer Indigenous by removing any ties to their family and their heritage. You can probably imagine that this was a very bad policy that was incredibly, incredibly damaging to so many people and so many communities, and remember, it's the 60s scoop. I don't know about you guys, my parents were born in the 1960s, and they're not even old, they're quite young still. This is something that was done to people who are alive now, there are people and families and communities who still every day live with the consequences of these policy decisions. So to see someone who has no ties to the situation, who learned about it in passing on a Wikipedia deep dive, who doesn't have any real connection or understanding of it, to take a real traumatic experience 
that is still causing people so much pain and suffering now, to take that, to turn it into a cute feel-good story and then profit from it just really doesn't sit right with me. I know that this book is super popular, I know that a lot of people love it, honestly, I would have as well if I had not seen this sort of blow up on Twitter literally in the one day between when I finished reading it and when I'm filming this review. But given that information, I just can't look at it the same way and it's the sort of thing where I was glad I learned even if it didn't make me happy, so I feel like I have to address that and I can't just look past it. I will link to a transcript of the interview and also a Goodreads review that addresses this possibly better than I do in the description down below if you would like more information. And my final read for the month of May was Sweet Spot by Amy Ettinger. This was the book in the summer edition of the Bookmarks and Breadsticks subscription box. Thank you to the lovely Kim for sending that to me to unbox for you guys. I will link a video up here if you would like to see me awkwardly trying to unbox things and realizing why influencers get paid so much because it's actually really hard. But for now we're talking about the book. I'm really sorry Kim, I did not like this book. And I feel really bad saying that because you picked it out and I really like you and most of the time your picks are amazing but this one did not work for me. Sweet Spot is a journalist who really loves ice cream and decides to learn more about it. I think is the best way to describe this book. And for me most of the issues came down to the narrator. I love the topic. Deep dive into ice cream? Yes! Sign me up! I would love to learn more about ice cream. Even the way it's approached I think could have been really great with a different author. I don't know, I'm so sorry Kim, I really wanted to love this book but honestly I just found the author insufferable and there was way too much author in here to get around that. Don't take that as a bad reflection on the Bookmarks and Breadsticks subscription box though, I'm very excited about the fall edition and even though I didn't love this book, I'm still looking forward to buying that one and reading that book. Some books just aren't for anyone and if you've read this book, please let me know down below how did you get on with it? Is this just a like me having a weird not gelling with this author thing? I don't know, maybe that's the case. It's been like an hour since I started filming now, so I should wrap this up. Let me know down below, what did you read in May? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it a great reading month? Are you in a slump? Let me know about it down below, and also if you have read any of these books, make sure to tell me what you thought so we can chat in the comments. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you would like to see more of my videos, please hit subscribe, and thank you for watching.